Thoros civil disobedience, so very misunderstood. I hate to lead off this way, but it's true. I've read this text many, many times, and I've taught it many, many times, and it astonishes me how wrong people are about it. And I, and I don't mean that in some dogmatic manner. I mean, they just get basic facts about it wrong. It's, it's as though they think they've read it and they never really have. Even the title isn't correct. Everybody calls it civil disobedience, and I guess I have to do that or people don't know what you're talking about. But the true title of the piece, as it was published um, in 1849 in the aesthetic papers, is Resistance to Civil government. That's the title Thoreau gave it. Um, and uh, it's it's not something that uh, 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 ever gets published in anthologies. They always publish it as civil disobedience, it seems. Uh, Norton Anthology does it right. But uh, in any event, it, it begins with the title and it goes through the whole darn thing. Uh, so many people have it so wrong. Most people know much of the story. Henry David Thoreau decides not to pay his poll taxes, the tax you had to pay to vote. Um, Back in the day, it's not constitutional anymore to charge people a tax to go vote. Uh, but he does so because the United States had gone to war against Mexico. And of course, if you're from Texas or you lived here for a while, you probably know a lot about, more about the Mexican War than non-Texans do. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why the United States went to war against Mexico was because we wanted um, Texas to eventually become part of the United States. Well, why did that happen? Well, there were southern congressmen that wanted Texas in the Union because they knew that Texas would come in as a slave state. So the Mexican War sort of wasn't fooling anybody, and certainly not Henry David Thoreau. The Mexican War was part partly about getting Texas into the Union as a slave state because existing slave states wanted one more set of votes in Congress to balance out the non-slave states. Um, so this is a huge thing that we're going to get into much later in the course, uh, especially about the politics of it, uh, uh, that we won't dwell too much on that. So he wouldn't pay the poll tax. And, and the other part of the sort of the story is that it supposedly inspired Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Well, there's definitely evidence that Martin Luther King read it directly, and there's some evidence that Gandhi read it, but the fact of the matter is that King formulated sort of his own political philosophy on his own in consultation with others, and Gandhi, if he had any passing notion of it, um, probably read it briefly, but he was so influenced by so many other things that it certainly didn't inspire his passive resistance notion, because nowhere in the text does Thoreau ever talk about passive resistance or nonviolent uh, uh, protest and that sort of thing like Martin Luther King does. So, you know, I, 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 I think that the two really probably had some knowledge of this text, maybe even read it, but it's often over-attributed. Um, they give a little bit too much credit to the text in inspiring these two great freedom fighters. Um, but I, 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 I got to say that Gandhi and King probably would have thought very similarly to uh, Thoreau on this, and uh, uh, so there's no you know, um, inconsistency there. Um, this is a very, very misunderstood piece on a lot of different levels. First, both political liberals and conservatives love it and they hate it. Liberals love it because they absolutely love the radical individualism. You know, people shouldn't tell you what to do. You should be able to sort of be the unique individual that you are and screw the establishment, okay? Um, on the other hand, conservatives love it because this guy just rails against government. And government oppresses, government's too intrusive, government keeps telling us what to do all the time, government's constantly making us into, the, you know, um, its, its puppets and its servants, and the people should rule the government, not the other way around, and the government this and the government. So conservatives love the fact that, that he trashes government quite a bit. Liberals love the fact that, you know, these guys, you know, he's, he's for standing up for himself and screw the rest of the establishment and all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, conservatives are made quite uncomfortable with this notion that he doesn't like the American government. You know, ooh, wow, wait a minute, wait a minute, you, you're not going to say the Pledge of Allegiance? You're not going to, you know, stand and wrap yourself in the flag? You're not going to, you know, you're not going to, you know, my country tis of thee? What's up with that, you dirty commie? Um, and on the other hand, liberals don't like the fact that he is the last person who would believe that collective action to solve social injustice, poverty, unemployment, social programs, he would be the last person to endorse that. He thinks that's evil. So 
everybody finds a reason to be uncomfortable with Henry David Thoreau, except possibly libertarians. He's very libertarian in the piece, um, uh, and uh, you'll see that if you know anything about libertarianism. Um, just about everyone has either misunderstood or misapplied its precepts. We're gonna we're gonna see that uh, particularly as we as we go forward in it. And few people understand just how radical it is. It is much more radical than people think. I mean, I've seen this this thing taught in civics classes, and you're sitting there thinking this ninth grade teacher has got no clue what she's actually having these students read uh, because this guy is really radical. He is at heart an anarchist. Look at the way it opens. He says, I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least. Okay, and you can hear all the conservatives applauding. Well, just wait, conservatives. You're going to get the rest of it in a moment. Uh, and I should like to see it acted upon more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which I also believe. That government is best which governs not at all. Wait a minute. What kind of government doesn't govern at all? One that doesn't exist. He's an anarchist at heart. And he says, now that makes conservatives really nervous, right? Whoa, 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 anarchy. Wait a minute. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Okay, so he doesn't believe people are ready for anarchy, but he certainly thinks that we ought to go there. Government is at best an expedient but most governments are usually, and all governments are uh, sometimes, inexpedient. Meaning, they're there for efficiency's sake. But every one of them is inefficient almost all the time. Um, the government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present Mexican War, the act of comparatively a few individuals using the standing government as their tool. For in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. Look, even a popularly elected government, you've got a situation where a handful of people can do stuff with the government that the majority doesn't have time to react against. So even if you say government exists, especially this one, to express the will of the people, it doesn't always do that. And even when it does, it may not do it fast enough to prevent disaster or tragedy or abuse. And even when it expresses the will of the people, that's no guarantee that the will of the people is a good will. After all, Hitler was elected. Um, you know, he, he had a majority. Uh, and so do other tyrants. They get elected all the time. Hitler ran saying, if you elect me, I will become a dictator. You understand what you're voting for, don't you? And the people said, yes. Um, so, you know, Thoreau's point is, look, just, you know, there's nothing magic about, about democracy, and, and there's nothing magic about government, even when it expresses the will of the people, it is subject to the same foibles and, and, and uh, inefficiencies and everything that the overall people are subject to themselves. He asks a series of questions, um, oh, by the way, he says sometimes you know, things happen even despite the government. He says, uh, uh, trade and commerce, if they were not made of India rubber, would never manage to bounce over the obstacles which legislators are constantly putting in their way. It's a wonder, he says, that business gets done in a country with a government, um, but they seem to be able to carry on business despite the goodwill and good intentions of all the regulators in Washington. Um, he says, I ask at once not... I ask for not at once no government, but at once a better government. So I, at heart I'm an anarchist. I know that's not going to happen right now. I know you look at me like I'm crazy. But if you can't give me anarchy, at least give me a better, more intelligent government than what we've got right now. Oh, how dare you, Henry? This is America. This is the greatest government that anybody ever devised. And he says, look, it's better than almost everyone that I've ever seen. That's true. But that's not really saying much because it's not a substitute for the individual's conscience. He decides uh, to ask a few questions uh, and says, what is this, this lecture that I'm giving uh, to explain why I got arrested? What is it that I'm going to be bringing up? What kinds of questions? He says, can there not be a government, he asks, in which majorities do not virtually decide right and wrong, but conscience, in which majorities decide only those questions to which the rule of expediency is applicable? Must the citizen ever for a moment or in any least degree resign his conscience to the legislator? Granted, we live in a democratic society. I understand that. But should the majority, should right and wrong be something that is determined by majority rule? Or should things like, should we build a road or should we build a school here or should we um, build a port here? Shouldn't that be the kind of things that majorities decide? And right and wrong should be a matter of individual conscience. 
Um, can there be a government where majorities do not virtually decide right and wrong, but conscience, he asks. Why has every man a conscience, then? I mean, if government decides matters of conscience, why were we given a conscience as individuals? If, if government makes all these decisions about what's right and wrong, whether I should or shouldn't eat this kind of food or should or shouldn't engage in this kind of behavior, I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think right. <gasps> How dare you? How arrogant, you might say. No, it's not arrogant at all, according to Thoreau. He says the only thing that I have an obligation to do is not obey the law, but to do what's right. If I do what's right, I'm always in the right. If I do what's right and it's consistent with the law, then there's no problem. If I do what's right and it's inconsistent with the law, that's the law's problem and it needs to change, not me. Law, he says, never made men a whit more just. Now that's an interesting thing because when you think about what he's saying here, he's saying that laws don't exist because they are effective in getting people to do right. In other words, look at it the other way, half empty rather than half full. Laws exist because people write down what they think people ought to do and ought not to do. But we already have a sense of right and wrong before we write the laws or we wouldn't have anything to write down in the law books, would we? In other words, laws don't exist because without them people wouldn't know how to behave. People learn how to behave and know how to behave and then they write down ways to, that people should behave. In other words, Thoreau would argue, People don't refrain from murder because there's a law against it. People refrain from murder because it's wrong. If tomorrow there were no law against murder, do you think there would be more murderers than there are now? Thoreau would say no, because murderers are going to murder despite the law. And most people who don't murder don't murder not because there's a law against it. Uh, you know, I kill Aunt Sarah, but, you know, I don't want to do the time. No. Most people don't murder because they know murder is a bad thing. Their conscience tells them it's a bad thing. Well, there are some people who would like to murder Dr. Lytton, and they only refrain from murdering for fear of the consequences. Thoreau would say, no, they don't. No, they don't. They don't do it because of fear of consequences. They do it because they either don't have the guts to do it or because it's not convenient to do it. But give them enough time, and they'll overcome their fear of the consequences. They'll become murderers if they're going to become murderers anyway. We don't have laws against rape or m robbery because we think that that will keep people from raping or robbing. We have laws against those kinds of things because we already know they're bad, and it makes us feel good to write down what we think is good and bad. This is according to Thoreau, not Dr. Lytton.